Um, thank you all for being here. It's wonderful to see your faces. I think that all of you here know who I am. I'm Haley Wood. I'm the director of the Hadley Senior Center. Um, I've been here a little less than a year, um, but so for the sake of the community who might be watching, that's who I am. And I'm just so delighted to uh, be able to be a part of this conversation featuring Senator Joe Comerford, um, who I will just mention that I've known for over 20 years. Um, in various capacities and couldn't be more happy with her representation of us um, in the state Senate. Um, I want to also mention that we, uh, I'm, I am speaking in Violet, we're, we're talking from our new um, senior center where we, that was built and, and completed in late May. We moved in in June. Um, so staff has been here for a couple of months and we're just slowly cracking open public access with as much care and caution as we can possibly manage. Um, and so I'm, I'm, we're gradually seeing the, the public once again and we're very happy and incredibly grateful to taxpayers in Hadley for supporting this beautiful uh, deluxe facility that fully respects older adults. Um, I'm sure that Every, I, I would sense that many of you are aware of Joe's many accomplishments and her varied career in public service. Um, when I first met her over 20 years ago, she was the executive director of the American Friends Service Committee. Um, from there, she moved on to the Food Bank of Western Mass, where she really um, developed a strong ability in food distribution and food um, security in our region, um, which I think we all have a sense of gratitude for. Um, after that, she was the executive director of the National Priorities Project, um, an incredible organization that continues to analyze the way our country's tax dollars are spent. Um, and then she became a campaign director for Move On, where, um, to my mind, uh, she really honed and perfected her skills as a communicator, which we get the opportunity to enjoy um, in full um, in, in her new role as senator. Um, I, so I welcome you all, um, and I welcome you, Joe, um, and I just want to thank you for advocating for many different constituencies, including older adults, um, and I want to just put in, put, put in a, a little bit of information that older people over 60 in Hadley, Massachusetts comprise 32% or more of the, of the residents here, so it's a strong and important um, group to be thinking about their specific needs, so thank you for being here. It is such a pleasure. I've been really so much looking forward to this. And boy, Haley and Violet and everybody, I have to get to the Senior Center. Um, so we'll make a time for me to come when everybody thinks it's safe. Um, and I can't wait. I, I remember getting to the initial groundbreaking celebration. Uh, and I am also celebrating with you and so grateful to the Hadley community for investing, as you say, in older adults. Um, I will say that part of the way I campaigned was listening deeply and uh, members of our community who really wanted to weigh in on elder affairs absolutely shaped the way I entered the legislature. Uh, and I'll talk about a number of bills I both supported and filed. Um, and it's all because of constituents like you all saying, hey, this is unfair uh, and we have to change that. Or here's an idea that other states are doing. Can you try this? Uh, and you're kind of robust and um, experience and you know uh, coming from a place of real authenticity pu pushes me forward all the time and actually no that's true for constituents in general but nowhere is it more true than with elder affairs legislation um, so keep your ideas coming um, and uh, you know we're building the platform for next session I'll talk to you a little bit about this session but next session starts in January and so I'll be filing another slate of bills uh, and trying to move the needle on things that make sense for us here in Western Massachusetts and for specific constituencies. Um, so thanks for that warm introduction. Uh, uh, congratulations, Haley, um, on this role. It's wonderful um, to have you there. Uh, and thanks to Violet for the hustle um, and organizing today's program. Um, as, as folks said, I do represent us. I represent Hadley and 23 other communities in the Massachusetts State Senate. There are 160,000 folks. Um, our district starts at the, North, uh, the New Hampshire and Vermont border and moves all the way down the Connecticut through Hadley, gorgeous Hadley, um, to Northampton and South Hadley. So it's, um, it's vast uh, in size. It's 675 
square miles. And I do like to say, and I do often say, um, that it is absolutely the most beautiful district uh, in the state. We are the lungs of the Commonwealth, our, our open spaces, our farms, not unlike Hadley, um, boast some of the most fertile, most important agriculture land um, that we have. And in fact, um, our forests are really providing not only a kind of open space recreational um, uh, boost for the Commonwealth, but also actually, you know, sequestering this key amount, at, along with farmland, key amount of carbon for us all. So it's a, it's a major service. Um, and I will say that one of the bills that I just pushed forward was a, a, inspired by a Hadley farmer. It was a low and no-till farming bill. I'll get to el elder affair legislation, but it's going to help farmers and they're, pi they're pioneering this more in Hadley than anywhere else, um, uh, bring in new farming techniques that will sequester more and more carbon, which will help our atmosphere. So Hadley's not only feeding us, uh, but it is part of the climate solution that we all really need and, and deserve. Um, so uh, folks may know this and I'll go through just a few pieces just to make sure that I, I introduce myself properly to you. When I came into the state Senate, I was appointed as Senate chair of the Joint Committee on Public Health. I was really delighted for that chair appointment, um, very honored to have it. And it allowed me to do a lot of really important work. Public health, as many folks know, um, is a vast area of exploration. It's where the End of Life Options Act landed. Uh, so I got to not only support that, which I did, thanks to constituents who urged me on, but I actually got to work on it. Um, and we worked on it a great deal while it was in committee. And we were able to, for the first time, pass it favorably out of committee. Uh, and I'm glad about that. Again, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the Senate president also appointed me to chair the COVID-19 working group for the legislature. Uh, I didn't expect that appointment. I was glad to take it on. Um, I was also appointed uh, as a member of the Racial Equity Task Force. These are two new task forces um, in the Senate to address this moment. Uh, I'm also working very hard on key bills like the Economic Development Bond Bill, the Transportation Bill, which has some key provisions uh, for transportation uh, increases actually with elder communities in mind. Um, so there's, there's a lot of work still happening in the Senate. You may have heard, and I wrote about this in the Dear Joe column, I don't know if anybody sees that in the Gazette, but I answer questions and we got a lot of questions uh, about, hey, what the heck happened? Um, are you, does the legislature ever recess? What happens? We heard something about a vote to extend formal sessions. So just let me say briefly, we work on a two year cycle um, and so we're in right now the 2122, uh, sorry, 2021, forgive me, 2021 legislative session. And in this traditionally in the second year, so we're in the second year of the legislative session. So I've been in office about a year and a half. Um, uh, it seems like it's much longer than that, uh, but it is the very best and most uh, honor I've ever had to do a, a piece of work. But generally around July 31st, we stop meeting formally. And when we say we stop meeting formally, the work doesn't stop. We never adjourn as a legislature. We're a year round legislature. It's just that because right now, um, through our uh, constitution, through our laws, we, we, are, uh, we run every two years. Um, our predecessors hundreds of years ago thought that we should stop meeting formally in the summer so as to not um, really intertwine politics or campaigning with legislating. Um, so uh, they took us out of formal session and informally lots of things still pass and work still continues, but the debating and the voting would stop in this last, you know, quarter of a year, if you will. Um, this year, because of COVID, uh, because we did about 20 COVID pieces of legislation in the spring, leaving other things to be somewhat delayed, um, like some of the things I'll talk about, we pushed out to through the end of 2020 our ability to do what's called formal sessions. Um, so things on the docket that we still have to do, um, we have to pass a budget. We have an interim budget uh, that's lasting through October. This is a very key piece of work and I'm going to fight for not an austerity budget, uh, but one that continues to invest uh, public funds where they deserve and belong to go, um, uh, deserve to go and, and belong. 
we have to reconcile what are called conference committee reports. Uh, there are numbers of them out. That's when the House and the Senate pass two different versions of the bill and six good souls come together uh, and they try to figure out what the right compromise is between the two chambers. And so there are five conference committees working on things like I mentioned, economic development, transportation, healthcare, climate. Uh, so those are moving forward. And then actually, uh, I, I imagine that we'll have to pass more COVID related legislation. Um, as you all know, I'm sure the COVID healthcare crisis, so the pandemic was met with an economic crisis. Um, and across our region, people are really struggling. Workers are struggling terribly. Uh, how people are feeling housing insecure. People need more access to testing, to better and more equitable healthcare services, um, like telemedicine. All of these things are have been pieces of legislation that we've pushed forward. And now that the pandemic and the economic crisis continues, um, we have to continue to respond. Um, for example, one of the bills that we'll have before us will ex actually extend uh, the inability of water districts to shut off water. We've, uh, that comes to an end at the end of September. And so people are now getting notices across our valley that because they haven't paid, because they've been out of work, um, their water bill will, that has, uh, is such that they will uh, risk losing uh, potable water. So the, the circumstances that we face every day, that our neighbors face every day are extremely acute. Um, so we are going to be in formal session all the way through uh, the um, end of 2020. And the COVID working group that I chair um, will continue to prioritize the kinds of bills. So we did a, a bunch of bills when we first got in. We did a, a housing insecurity bill. We did an economic unemployment bill. Um, the state boosted some of the provisions. They helped small businesses, nonprofits, other, other cohorts of people who were being hard hit. We tried to do surgical strikes. We are also, of course, working with our federal delegation because while the state can't deficit spend by law, the federal government can stretch uh, and should, I believe, stretch in the form of a stimulus for us, not unlike what we were able to do in 2008. Um, we haven't had uh, as much of a seamless interaction. Uh, Washington's a pretty bumpy place, as folks know um, or may agree. And so uh, it's been a quite a tumultuous time for states like Massachusetts. And so we're, we're hoping to make it through this year, hoping for another boost um, of education spending, healthcare spending, uh, unemployment spending, and the like. Um, and so, and we've of course been working on things like uh, personal protective equipment or PPE. Uh, testing, funding um, for that at the state level and mandating those things at the state level as well. Um, so the, I'll just transition quickly to the Public Health Committee, then we'll talk about the end of life options and then I'll open it up. Um, so the Public Health Committee, we had about 475 bills in the Public Health Committee. It's one of the largest committees. It means that it gets a lot of bills filed. Again, public health it itself is vast. I've come to think of public health as being all but invisible until we don't have it. Um, and that's the trick with public health, right? We don't think about, um, and, our, and our Commonwealth doesn't have right now, a tremendously robust public health infrastructure. We have 351 basically different ways of doing public health in the Commonwealth. So actually one of the things I'm working on is a, a, actually quite a, very, a vast public health bill to help the Commonwealth really think about an infrastructure um, that's not top heavy, but that will be able to support municipalities like Hadley uh, to the, have the kind of services that uh, you deserve to have. And with the money um, that doesn't leave ta Hadley taxpayers having to, to foot that bill. Um, so we did a bunch of different bills uh, in the Public Health Committee. Um, our committee was actually really productive. Uh, we did a ban on vaping, for example. One of the earliest bills was a ban on vaping, uh, flavored vaping products, which disproportionately affect young people, get them hooked on vaping. Um, and also a ban on menthol cigarettes, uh, which came especially as a request from communities of color, feeling particularly targeted um, by the sales, uh, the way that uh, tobacco companies were selling uh, to their communities. And so we banned it in the Commonwealth out of the Public Health Committee. We had a bill, we worked on it, we passed it, 
And now it's law that flavored vaping products um, are no longer sold uh, in the Commonwealth. And we're hoping to look at some research and we're hoping to see the number of kids getting hooked on vaping and uh, eventually cigarettes really decrease. That's our hope as a result of this. We also did a, a lot of work on maternal health um, and uh, these are bills that would look at uh, the role of nurse practitioners and, um, and other public health officials being able to bolster women's choices in their own health. Um, and we looked also a lot at environmental um, relationships with uh, public health. And we looked at things like toxins, toxins in our water, um, toxins in our food, uh, and what we needed to do um, to really eliminate those considerably. Um, so it was a, a, a very, very robust um, year sprint uh, through the Public Health Committee. Um, and again, one of the biggest bills we did um, was S1208 and H1926, an act relative to end of life options. Uh, this bill was introduced by Senator Will Brownsberger. He picked it up from an outgoing Senator and Representative Lou Kafka. Um, it essentially, the, the summary of it is that it would allow patients uh, with terminal conditions to exercise their right to a peaceful death with dignity. Um, and at the same time, it establishes a rigorous process for patients and physicians to follow in order to protect anyone who could be vulnerable or targeted from coercion. Um, we heard about 12 hours of testimony. Um, it was the second longest hearing uh, the vaccine hearing, um, which was also another very big body of work that we did, was 13 and a half hours of testimony. Um, but the end of life options was uh, very moving. And we heard a lot of testimony, a lot. And we got in really hundreds, probably more than a thousand in the end, now that I think about it, pieces of testimony. Again, a lot from our district, you know, really talking about, <laughs> I love seeing cats in frames. Um, Hello, hello. Um, uh, a lot talking about the, uh, the personal experiences that people had had and really urging us to have the courage of our conviction for the first time. And again, I'm really delighted that we were able to pass it out for the first time. I will say that we heard a lot also from the disability rights community and the disability rights community had a different perspective. Um, and uh, we had we dedicated, my team in particular, dedicated many hours. We dedicated two full-time Harvard fellows uh, to this. And we really met extensively with disability rights advocates who really wanted to make sure that whatever we passed, and that's the piece I was talking about earlier, wouldn't be in any way negatively used for people um, living with disabilities who have always felt like they had to justify their existence and always felt um, like they were the, have the potential of being a burden, that this was really used on the other side for terminally ill people who wanted some choice in how their life ended, um, which is of course the initial intention um, of the legislation. So uh, it is, um, it's a, we expanded the bill considerably in committee, that's what passed out. Uh, I think we strengthened it a very, um, uh, a very good measure. And actually, I'm just going to pause to see if folks would benefit from a quick summary of the bill. Do you want to know what the bill looks like? Or do you know enough about it so we can go into more of a discussion? I'd enjoy the, the, the outline if others feel there's time for that. I'd appreciate it. Are you okay with that too? Okay. All right, I'm going to go. Uh, I won't belabor it, but I'll go through a little bit of an outline so you have a sense. Um, of what it is. So again, the bill prescribes a comprehensive process for patients to access aid in dying medication. The patient's medical record has to contain documentation, documentation rather, excuse me, covering the entire process. Um, so adult residents of Massachusetts would be able to request this if they are terminally ill. Uh, the patient must make both an oral and a written request, at, and those have to be at least 15 days apart. Um, the written request must be signed by two witnesses who certify that the patient is acting voluntarily and not being coerced. Um, the bill now contains some safeguards that ensures that at least one witness is not a relative or a hospital employee or someone who would financially benefit 
uh, from a patient's death. Um, that's a, another piece of the coercion. We also added, and this again was um, part of the testimony we received from the um, more elder or senior community and the disability rights community, uh, no one who is signing as a witness can be potentially financially taxed uh, by the person's healthcare costs, right? Because we didn't want that, um, we didn't want anybody acting out of anything other than as a witness, as an ally to the person who's asking for this, as an, you know, no one acting out of a place of feeling burdened in any way. So we, took, we removed that entirely from the, the equation. Uh, the request would be coordinated by an attending physician, um, and that attending physician would have a prior relationship with the patient. The attending physician would determine whether it would certify that the person is terminally ill. Um, the attending physician must also discuss the patient's diagnosis, prognosis, risks, alternatives now, and additional treatment like palliative care. Um, again, we didn't want to box people out of that, that alternative, that opportunity, um, inadvertently through the legislation. Um, the attending physician also refers uh, the patient to someone in the mental health field, just to make sure, again, that the, a mental health professional is able to make sure that the patient understands their rights, their full platter of rights. Um, and uh, the attending physician also gets a second opinion uh, from someone who has no financial relationship with that attending physician, so not in the same practice. Um, again, that's a safeguard for the patient, it's a safeguard for uh, the physician also, but mostly for the patient. Um, so after all these physician referrals, which actually can happen very, very quickly over a period of weeks, um, the physician can prescribe aid and dying medication. Um, uh, and there's, you know, some just verifications in there where the physician just makes sure that the person understands all of the care that's available to that person. Um, and at any point, the patient can rescind the request. Um, and healthcare providers can choose whether or not to participate in providing aid in dying. Um, they, do not, they do not face criminal or civil liability uh, if they don't participate. Uh, and we uh, didn't want anybody to be doing this work if they didn't believe in it, uh, because that could really risk the patient's well being. Um, and then as a safeguard, the Department of Public Health will look at um, the records of physicians, right, who will have to note that they've worked with someone just to make sure that there isn't some physician who has a disproportionate number of these. Um, you know, I think that's just going to keep a light on so that we're going to collect the data and just make sure like, ah, oh, there's a physician in some part of the Commonwealth who has a lot of people doing this. And in fact, the average is two or three a year, perhaps, or something like that. So we're, um, we're going to just check that uh, and keep that on. So, um, so the, that's the general outline um, of, of the bill. Um, and before I go on, I just want to give you a, a, before we open it up to questions, the thing that I didn't tell you is, I, is the list of bills that uh, I filed that had to do, again, were more rooted in the senior community. So um, I, I won't talk about these in depth, but I'm happy to answer questions. Um, one is authorizing spouses to serve as caregivers. Right now in the Commonwealth, it's shocking, right? Nieces can get paid, nephews can get paid, um, brothers and sisters can, pay, can get paid, but a spouse can't get remuneration for caring for their loved one. It is a way I believe that the uh, Commonwealth makes money off the backs of couples who are gonna provide this service. But when we think about the elder insecurity of Massachusetts elders, um, and the fact that we have one of the highest elder insecurity, financial elder insecurity rates in the nation, this is not something we should tolerate, right? People should be able to get paid for caring for their loved one, um, whether they're gonna do it or not, whether that's the preference of the family or not. Um, and that would help everybody um, with economic security. Um, I have a bill, especially on uh, telemedicine services with a focus on elders. Um, I have a bill that supports equal access to community care. It's, uh, it allows people to receive, seniors to receive mass health home and community-based care, even if their income is slightly over the limit. Um, and this is called a cliff effect bill. And right now it 
what happens is if you're if you're receiving at home care and say something happens, you know, you're uh, you get a bequest or some, something happens and your income goes up even a little bit, twenty dollars, a hundred dollars. Um, you can't uh, you can't continue to receive at home care. And this simply says, oh, um, we can fix that extremely quickly. Um, uh, we can uh, allow the person who maybe has $100 more that month to simply pay $100 more of the premium um, and stay at home rather than having to transition, uh, which is right now mandated, right? A liquidation of assets and transitioning into a nursing home. It's, I think, barbaric. Um, and so we're, we're fighting for that. All of these bills, I'm happy to tell you, um, we were able to fight for and get passed favorably out of their committees. Uh, so these are alive um, in the legislature. So all of these bills, some for the first time, were passed favorably. Um, and uh, so I, that they're among the kind of bills I'll keep fighting for this fall. Um, and uh, we'll certainly um, consider filing again with good ideas and better tweaks from folks like you. Um, so now I will really stop and um, take your questions and comments. Jane. So my question about the right to die bill, if we can call it that, um, what provision is there for somebody in advance of having Alzheimer's making that provision, but then when in fact it gets close to the time that they might be dying, to have it imposed when they are no longer capable of communicating? It's a very good question. Um, the, a person who is, it, it, it right now is about a terminal illness um, uh, and Alzheimer's is not uh, necessarily characterized in that terminal category unless it's more advanced as I'm sure you know, Jane. And, um, so it is, there isn't a provision for an early part of the Alzheimer's disease. Um, there are, of course, other medical um, declarations, as you all know, that you can make, um, power of attorney and other things um, to help plan. Uh, but the end of life dying, it, it doesn't serve as well um, for folks struggling with Alzheimer's. This is more of a, this is more, um, uh, issues like st uh, severe stroke, where the person can still make some decisions, or cancer, um, or other forms of real debilitation, um, in a uh, in that sense. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Uh, but there are many other things besides Alzheimer's that make a person unable to give an oral request. You had said it must be a written and oral people with LAS or stroke, where they're no longer able to speak. Um, so that seems like a rather strong restriction in my book. It is, it's a limitation of the bill. Um, uh, it is, um, again, these, these have to be terminal diagnoses um, with these restrictions. I think you, you all probably know this. Uh, this, is, this has been filed for many, 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 many years. It has never made it out of committee. Um, ever. And you, you know the legislative process. It has to go out of the Committee of Jurisdiction and then onto the floor of both the House and the Senate um, and, and then get voted favorably and then get reconciled. So it's a very long journey for a piece of legislation. Um, and uh, this has some boundaries on it and still um, hasn't been able to get out favorably or get to the floor. So uh, just uh, help me understand. So if it were to become a law, this would mean we don't have to have this on the ballot. Is that right? Exactly, right, um, exactly. Uh, I, you know, I know there's ballot work and I think that's incredibly important because the legislature has essentially failed people who support this bill um, and failed you for too long. Um, and so ballot work is exceedingly important. We've seen that work on a number of issues uh, that folks may care about um, on this call. Uh, so, right, exactly. If we were able to get this by law, um, it would, would mean that the ballot, um, the ballot wouldn't necessarily be necessary. That said, 
um, the ballot could be necessary if it's not exactly, if it doesn't like this legislation in some way, or if the ballot language is uh, somewhat different from what the legislature passed in the end. No bill ever goes, comes out the way it goes in, in the legislature. There are many processes that, you know, that talk to stakeholders, that do research on an issue, um, that take input, that, you know, make legal changes. And so the bill itself is still going to evolve all the way through. So I have a question. What happens, this bill will pass, that's good. But if you want to then modify things like the thing that Jerry talks about, about verbal um, approval for people who have had a, a lack of speech as a result of some illness or accident, how hard is it to modify an existing bill? So first, I just want to say, Jane, uh, it's not a sure thing that this bill will pass. Um, Everything's positive thinking, Joe. Oh, I love it. No, all right. So let's stay positive. I'm going to stay positive with you. Um, uh, so yes. So if we want to modify a bill, in fact, that's e that is easier uh, because the legislature has already taken action on something. And uh, say, for example, the vaping bill I talked about, right? The legislature already did a big piece of work on tobacco. So there was already consciousness raised about the issue. Part of this is um, raising the consciousness of legislators to understand why the heck this is really a, um, a civil right, if you will, um, you know, and, uh, or a, you know, a, a personal choice that must be, uh, remain a personal choice and that the state doesn't have a, any business in interfering. Um, and that is a, uh, that it would be a piece of work if this, we're lucky to get this to the floor, um, that would have been work and passed favorably. That would have been work that would have been done in the debate and the um, on the floor and the lead up to the bill discussion. You know, everybody would have had to, who hasn't already been tuned in on this would have would have to get smart on it before they're going to cast a vote. And so, therefore, to make it better, to make the legislation better, um, as you're both saying, would be easier because there'd be some track record in the body. Um, that the, the body of the legislature. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Um, you should you, you should feel free to let me have it too. Um, you know I work for you, uh, so I I do want to hear your feedback. Um, I really like that you tell us what you're doing in the Gazette in your column. I think that's a that's a new thing for, for our senator to do, and I appreciate it. I'm, I'm glad that works for you. You should send me a question. People who uh, send me questions, I have to answer them. I, I answer them publicly. So it's a, um, it's a good piece of accountability. I agree. I think of it as accountability. Jerry. So these items, I wrote down four or three or four that you said. They're out of committee, but there's no timetable for when they would actually come up for a vote. Is that right? That is correct. Um, that is correct. Uh, we, um, the, there are 6,000 bills filed, which is a shocking number every two years. Uh, and um, so my job now is to make the case for why these bills deserve to be considered um, amid everything else. Uh, as we end the 2020 year. So there isn't a timeline. Um, I would imagine all of our work will be concentrated in the October, November um, uh, band of time because we'll have to be in doing conference committee reports and uh, also the budget. So I would imagine you'll see a flurry, um, and I'll push for a flurry of work then. If, if this bill does not pass, the, can you tell of any other options for somebody who um, would like to make a decision for themselves about their end of life? Um, thanks for that question, Violet. Uh, I, there isn't anything by law that, that we have. That's why this bill is so crucial. 
And actually, one of the things I, I want to say is that if you're, if you're really wanting to help make sure this gets to the floor, the end of life options or any of the other bills that I talked about really so quickly, um, you should write uh, people in the legislature, the leadership in the legislature. And I'll take the time, if you don't mind, to just put some emails into the chat um, so that folks can, um, you know, if you're on email, that's great. You can also, of course, send a letter, although email is better if you can, uh, just because people are working in so many different locations, like their bedrooms. Um, <laughs> so our computer is um, our, where we're sort of our desk, essentially. Oh, I don't have a chat, actually. Violet, I'll email them to you. Okay, please, I will forward. Okay. So if you could have the bill numbers with that as well? Sure, yeah, for the end of life options. Yeah, I'll give you, I'll give you a lot of information. Okay. I found it difficult to find, I was interested in some other bills and to find out what the number was and how it had changed. And, and where it was was very difficult navigating the um, state website. Ah, I'm sorry. It is. It can be very difficult. In those cases, you know. Remember, I, I work for you, um, so I wanna. I would like to hear from you. You can write. You know, you, people write me all the time. Joe, what happened to that bill? And they'll just give me a few words, and I'll go figure it out. And I can tell you where it is um, easily, actually, and tell you where I think. And actually. Um, I wonder, can I share my screen? Oh, if Violet, uh -oh. if you can let me share my screen, I can show you a little trick. Would folks like to, would, would that be beneficial for so, folks? So, you know, I will make you a host and then you can do whatever, okay? Is that okay, Joe? Sure. Now you are the host, you can do whatever you want and you can end the meeting at any time you wish. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm just pulling up a, okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, so, can folks see this, the legislature? Yep. Yeah. So, um, I want to, MA legislature, um, first, that's the, that's the URL. When you go to MA legislature, um, you can type in um, any number of um, any number of either you can type in a number, you can type in a few words. But so, for example, if you were to type in end of life options, you'll see that it comes up. There's a bunch of different stuff that comes up on the screen. So I'm just going to click on the Senate version. In this case, there's both a Senate and a House version. That's not always the case. It doesn't matter. Um, so you're going to click there on that. It takes a little time as my computer grinds away. Um, and it'll come up. And you'll see sometimes, um, you'll see sometimes that there'll be different versions from different years. So that's, that can be a trap too. You just have to make sure that you're in the right. So you, you can see up in the upper left bill S1208 and it's the uh, 191st, the current legislative session. So that tells you that it's the right bill version. Um, and a bill like this that's been in so long, you, you might get something from two, two legislative sessions ago. So it tells you here um, that the presenter is uh, William Brownsberger. He's the senator. Again, I would have presented it, but it already had a senator. Um, and over here, you can see the text. You can see a print preview, which is basically another text version. You can also download a, a PDF version, um, which you can open and that PDF version shows you um, the bill in its entirety. So you can see who signed on uh, to support the bill if you, if you care to see that. Um, so, and you can see this bill has a lot of support in the legislature and that's because of people like you, uh, holding people like me accountable. Um, so I was, you can see Dan and I are both here and we represent you, we both work for you. Um, and that's good advocacy on your part. Um, 
And then you can go down here um, and you can see displaying eight actions. That means the bill took eight turns, basically. So it, refer it was referred to my committee um, and the House said, okay, yeah, it's okay. We can send it to Joe's committee. Um, and that's the, that's, that's the thing you can see on 122. Um, we scheduled it for an early hearing. A June hearing is an early hearing, so we had time to work on it. Um, and uh, we took a little bit more time to get it perfect, and the House concurred. Um, and then we, um, we reported it out, and then COVID hit, um, but we still reported it out as a new draft. Um, and so you can see that this is the new draft. That's what I was talking about. We used, we took, we, we didn't report out the same exact language. Um, and I'm trying to pull this up now. So you can see generally that it goes to another, um, another um, version of the bill. And that says that that's the bill that we wrote now. It's no longer Senator Brownsberger's bill, although it really is. And Rep Kafka's bill, it's the, but it was rewritten by the Joint Committee on Public Health. Um, and so then um, you can see that we reported it out and it was reported favorably um, to healthcare financing, which is the sort of big mama healthcare committee. Um, and uh, that's where it is. It, we then extended it out till 2020 so that we could keep it live uh, all the way through the session. So rather than foreclosing it, we said, okay, if we're going to meet in formal session, um, let's extend this. Um, so I'll stop, I'll stop sharing now. So uh, that was a quick and a zoomy way through, but really any kind of bills that you have questions on, I, I you really just email me directly and I'll get you the information you need to be strong advocates. Haley. Um, so I'm, I'm intrigued and I'm thinking about what it must be like for you to have some sense of raising the consciousness of legislators or having some awareness of your colleagues' sense of prioritization or what's important or what's really bubbling up as commonly understood as, as important and needing action. And in that vein, I'm wondering if you can comment, if, if you were to take the temperature of the legislature of the legislature on the Spouses and Caregivers Act. Um, that, that's something that I see quite a bit in my work as a SHINE counselor, and I see a lot of yeah, unremunerated spouses who are um, really have a heavy load, and I fully, believe, you know, I fully believe that they should be able to be paid for the work that they're contributing to humanity. And um, I'm just wondering if you sense a collegial sense of prioritization of that in the legislature of the spouses as caregivers yeah well i you know i think we were able to get it out favorably because we um if you were to look at this um the uh co-sponsorship of that bill too not unlike the end of life options you would see that a lot of people you know when we made the case for hey why is this why can right. your daughter or your niece or your nephew or your brother get paid for this but why can't loved ones get paid um, and people, when we put it that way, um, people were clearly like, oh, that's weird. We don't pay loved ones. Like it's part of it is awareness raising, as you're saying, and part of it is just putting it in a frame that makes sense to people. Um, so I think it's actually quite a priority. Um, I, I think people have a great deal of respect for the bill and the issue. Um, I will say, and this is where, um, we find out why it's been so long to get this to sort of break through and pass like we were able to do this session. Um, it's quite an expensive proposition for the Commonwealth, yeah. $35 right. million dollars, um, to pay spouses to be caregivers. Now, I think you and I both know, well, um, right now families, if, if, if elder, uh, elderly families are not getting the kind of economic remuneration that they deserve, then they may need other social supports, which of course they should get. Um, so we may be paying those same families, but in different ways with public money. Why not just pay them a, a fair wage for the work that they're doing, pay them in a different way, um, which may, may have give them potentially more dignity, more choice, more freedom, more self-determination, um, 
so we're going to pay it other ways. Um, let's pay it in the way that's actually fair. Um, right. And so that's how I framed it as we've talked about money. Uh, but I don't think there is, I, I think if I were able to get this to the floor of the Senate, the only thing that would be stopping me was the, would be the money. Right. Do, do you think that the passage of this bill would have a positive effect on savings in the costs of nursing home care, which are just, you know, which are incredibly burdensome to the state? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's think, how I would see it. Yeah. Think about it. Um, and it's the same as the other, the cliff effect bill that I have. Right. So, you know, right now you mean to tell me that if you just make for some reason a tiny bit more money relatively to nursing home costs, you have to leave your home. Um, you can't just equalize that in some fair way uh, and go into a nursing home, um, which is what's happening right now uh, as people reach the cliff effect moment. So it's the same thing. Right. Um, there is a case to be made. There isn't a study that's been a useful study about the um, about the potential cost savings in nursing home costs. So we are hiring a public health fellow um, for this summer to do that, um, the coming summer, uh, to do that, re to try to do that research uh, to help bolster, if we don't make it out this session, to help bolster the understanding that in fact, yes, it would be more money, but the potential cost savings for nursing home care, which is so through the roof, uh, could be exorbitant. <coughs> Good question. All of these are really important questions. Uh, Cynthia, and then Jane. Okay, it, it seems what you're saying, or what it sounds like, is that it takes a really long time to get a bill to the floor and actually voted on what and if you have like 6,000 bills I don't know if those are the ones waiting or the the ones that come up in a year but how many bills in a year get actually passed um, every legit that's a good question every legislative session is different um, uh, we have to remember that there are there are passage of bills in formal and informal sessions um, and the formal sessions uh, are fewer and far between. Uh, so the Senate and the House might meet just once formally um, and consider one, two or three bills, something like that. Um, and we do that once a week or so. Um, and then the informal sessions are every 72 hours. They just roll, roll, roll every 72 hours. Um, and those, there is a great deal of passage. Uh, here's a, Here's an example. Uh, Hadley had what was called a home rule petition, or Hadley has a number of home rule petitions. Um, and home rule is where the, the governing body um, uh, of Hadley puts forward and in, in the form of legislation to Dan and I, um, something that folks want to do. And these are in different shapes and sizes, um, and they need to be done either formally or informally. If there's, for example, something having to do with land, um, that often requires a full body vote, uh, but other things uh, that a town wants to do that, is, that have been considered by relative, rele relevant committees and worked on can also pass informally. So Hadley has had both versions of that this year, both a formal vote on an article, what was called an Article 97, which was a, again a land bill um, to preserve some uh, important land. And congratulations, Hadley, uh, for that work. Um, and then some informal. Uh, the, so there are hundreds and hundreds of informal bills that move through, um, hundreds. Uh, and again, every session is different. I'll be able to tell you what we do this session uh, when, we, uh, when I come back next year, hopefully, and talk to you in the Senior Center. Um, and then the formal sessions, uh, you know, right now, it, and there's two different kinds of passages. So the Senate itself has passed you know, upwards of about 65 bills formally. Um, that's not the number that have been signed into law by the governor yet. Again, we were delayed because of COVID. So then there's a bunch more COVID bills, um, but that are, uh, that really took our time from February up until now. Um, so again, our session looks very different this year. Um, so 
that those are not the bills that uh, necessarily have gotten pushed into law because maybe the House didn't do it, right? That's the tricky thing. The House and the Senate have to work together. Um, so um, the count, we'd have to look at the count lots of different ways. Bills that the Senate passed, bills that the Senate passed, that the House also passed, bills that got reconciled together um, that eventually made it to the governor's desk. So there's all different versions of the way we would think about bill passage. Thank you. Jane, did you have a question? Oh, I think you're mute, Jane. I'm mute. Yep. <laughs> okay, that seems unlikely. Um, <laughs> Earlier, you spoke about um, a water, like an abatement for people who were unable to pay their bills. Now I speak as a select board person. Is this going to be an unfunded mandate again that the towns are going to have to pick up? No, um, no, it wouldn't be much like the, um, the eviction and uh, the foreclosure moratorium. Uh, this is not a cost borne by the towns. Um, you know, right, this is not saying that uh, folks can never pay. They're saying that during a pandemic, uh, let's not create more people who are homeless currently. Okay. So it's not asking the town to do that. Same thing, it's the same idea. It's saying, um, you know, at a time where public health measures are saying you should really stay close to home and wash your hands a lot, um, you need water on in your house uh, to be able to do that um, and to be able to stay there. Um, so th that's, again, that's a small, although important, I'm not saying it's not important to the people who are facing this, and most of this is happening right now in Franklin County, actually. Um, uh, but it's, these are important pieces of the puzzle of responding in the pandemic, and I hear you with regard to unfunded mandates, I want to say. I think it's, it's um, the state behaves irresponsibly when we hand municipalities like Hadley that are doing exceedingly difficult business, um, uh, unfunded mandates. It is something I'm, I really, I promise that I'm always gonna speak up against. And if you see one coming and you're mad as a hornet about it, I want I want to know, um, I really do. Because it's okay. wrong to, for us to pass responsibility. We either have to take responsibility and not do it or find the money to give to the municipalities. I think we have time for one more. <laughs> have I talked you all in, into uh, oblivion? <laughs> Jerry. Actually, I had a question on something you raised, but um, was not. Uh, well, it, has, it could affect uh, seniors. And that had to do with the vaping um, bill that is what was, if I understand correctly, is what was permanently banned was the flavored vaping. And when I read it, the major concern was really what was put into it to cause problems. So is the restriction on other vaping uh, removed now? There is, yeah. That, so that was, there were two different things. What a good question and great memory. Um, so you, uh, you were, you're also, you're remembering back to, and we were doing two things at the same time. So the governor banned all vaping when there was- One year ago. Yep, exactly. When there was some concern nationally about chemical, you know, companies that were, um, putting out vapes that were, you know, very harmful to health. That had nothing to do with the flavors, um, the flavors at all. That really had to do with chemicals in the vapes themselves or the vaping uh, products. The vitamin E somehow was involved in how yep. they processed them. And so the governor banned them. And, I, you know, I supported that. It was a scary moment. And people were really, you know, they were either getting very sick or perishing. Um, so it was a good idea, although it was very abrupt and people had a lot of questions, because at the same time, we were looking at flavored vaping products and menthol cigarettes. And so people were like, You've, this, this, how did the Senate just ban vaping without taking a vote? And we said, no, 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 we didn't do that. The governor did that. We're looking at something different. We're looking at the way in which 
vaping flavors like Tutti Frutti and Fruit Loops are hooking a generation of kids into these products that we know are harmful to them and then are also disproportionately marketing to communities of color. Um, so we did that piece. We didn't do the ban. And so the ban was lifted and then, um, and then actually shortly after we passed the flavors vaping legislation and then the house passed it. And that's one of those instances where it went to a quick committee um, and then it moved on to uh, the governor's desk. So. Thank you. Thank well, you. Great. Did they ever find, do you know if they ever found out what was where that contamination was coming from or? The Department of Public Health did issue something. I can't remember exactly what it was at the time, at the time but I remember hearing that the governor felt comfortable enough to release the ban. Um, and it was a national thing. The attorney general got involved. It was a it was sort of, a, it was a national all eyes on this industry. Um, and they were able to gain some comfort that it was safe enough. So vaping continues in the Commonwealth, just no flavors are allowed here or the delivery of flavors. So we can't, you can't buy it and you can't have it delivered from Amazon um, or anywhere else um, into your house. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and with that, I, I'm afraid I have to go. I'm speaking with good folks from Deerfield now, um, but it's been a joy to be with you. And I really do hope I get to come and visit you in person um, again and see you. Uh, and thank you for this honor and this opportunity.